welcome to the Why God Why podcast. My name is Peter Englert. We are here with our fantastic producer, Nathan Yoder, and my friend, co-host Aaron Mercer. Wow. All right. I like it. Yeah. I, there we yeah, go. So, you know, so we're going to introduce Sally here in a second, but he's been using the word illustrious for me forever, but I guess it's a, it's a new year, so you're going to change it up yeah why not why so, not i'll take it speaking of being creative uh <laughs> segues are for beginners but uh today we're talking with sally gilroy she's a consultant she's served on staff she's also been a basketball coach in louisiana which we might get into that but she's responding to the question why are creatives the future of the church so i don't think it would be odd to our listeners that a communications director is co-hosting this with me. But <laughs> before we throw it over to Sally, uh, Aaron, do you have any thoughts for our listeners? No, I'm excited about this podcast. I think that Sally and I would have a lot to talk about. Um, and so I'm glad we get this opportunity to talk about it with all our, our listeners on the podcast. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think this is a great conversation. Why are creatives the future of the church? It's going to be fun. Um, I get to work uh, with a lot of creatives in my line of work. And, um, you know, it's fun. I think there's a lot of opportunities for the church to explore here. And I think that um, Sally's going to help us explore those. So, but I, I am curious. I mean, Peter, you, you, you whetted my appetite there. I want to know, you know, we, I think we, you said earlier, Sally is in New York City, um, and, uh, but was a coach uh, in Louisiana. I guess I'd want to know more about Sally's story first before we get into the creatives conversation. Can you give us a, can you give us a little bit of information about yourself, Sally? Yeah, absolutely. Well, glad to be here, guys, with you, Aaron and Peter. And um, yeah, so I'm from Louisiana originally, uh, born and raised there, grew up, went to school, did the whole thing, and just kind of was I played sports in high school, wasn't very good at them. <laughs> um, people always, and ended up as a college basketball coach. And a lot of times people will say, oh, you're just being humble. I'm not. Not one college in the United States recruited me to play basketball in college. <laughs> um, so I wasn't very good. So I became a coach. Um, nice. And so just kind of got into that. I actually taught world geography, too, in high school for a little while. Um, coach basketball and then had some just amazing opportunities to coach at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is right near Texas. Um, and we just had some amazing young women that we were able to coach and um, played in the NCAA tournament twice, um, which was probably the pinnacle of my coaching career, I guess <laughs> you could say. Um, and then went on to coach um, at University of Louisiana in Lafayette, the Raging Cajuns, which is my alma mater. And, um, you know, I grew up in the church and um, kind of just but never really developed, never had my own relationship with God, I think. Um, and just kind of went to college and um, probably wasn't living for the Lord. Not probably I wasn't living for the Lord. Um, and then when I graduated college and got into coaching and got into my career, um, just some unique divine opportunities with some really, really good people um, that you just started sharing their faith with me and just kind of I was able to see the fruit of their faith in their life. And I just, you know, how'd you get that? <laughs> what, what is that? Um, and they invited me to church and got involved with, you know, that church pastor, all that stuff became born again. Um, and I guess you could say the rest is history, I guess. Um, a lot of details in the middle of that somewhere, but yeah. So that's just kind of a quick overview. How did you get from, sorry, Peter, I'm going to no, follow up? You, no, you and I were reading minds. Uh, oh, I think we were probably asked the same question here, but I'll just, I'll just ask it. I interrupted Peter. But um, yeah, so how did you get from uh, basketball and geography to being in the creative well, actually, you know, I, I, maybe you can answer two questions at once here. Like, what does that even mean to be in a creative field? But how did you get to that? I mean, how, how did you, I, yeah. when you're talking geography, I mean, I guess you could make maps look fun or, and I love geography, don't get me wrong, because I think it's the, the playing field for, for basically history, which I was a history major. But, I, but I'm curious how you, how you would go from that to um, more of a creative profession. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's not a normal road, I guess, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think towards the end of my coaching career, um, I knew that the Lord was speaking me, speaking to me. To it was time to move on from coaching. Um, I was getting way more involved in ministry, just through the church, and even just some things, even in the athletic realm and college athletics. And I knew that um, I kind of had to lay that part of it down. I still would be involved in it, but kind of I was, you know, I knew. I knew that I need. I was supposed to get involved in some ministry type things, and um, was had some opportunities. I was going to go do some FCA stuff in Virginia, and just some different things. And then um, my pastor, the the man who led me to the Lord, one day we're on the phone. He goes what are you doing? You don't need to do all that stuff. You need to stay right here. We need to, we need to get an athletic ministry here at our own church. So kind of said, man, you're right. So started praying through that and ended up coming on staff, um, starting an athletic ministry. There was one for guys um, and then came on staff and we started an athletic ministry for, for girl sports in the area. We had relationships with all the high schools and things like that. So I still got to do the coaching and the ministry side together. And then as you both know, um, and as sure many people are listening, when you work in the local church, you end up, um, you get involved in a lot of things. So a few months after that, the youth pastor left. And so the pastor said, well, you guys are doing athletic ministry. Why don't you all take over the youth ministry? Then a few months later, the college pastor left. They said, well, you're in youth. Why don't you do college? So did college. Um, and then just a couple of years later, they said, well, the creative director just left. Why don't you be creative director? And I was like, <laughs> I have no, I don't even know, like I'm friends with the creative team, but I have no idea even what, I don't know what that means. Um, and I remember our pastor said, we don't need you to be creative. Um, they're, they're creative. They're good. We just need you to coach them. Mm. It's just like a basketball team. He's like, we need you to coach them. And um, I'll never forget that because I think, and Aaron, you probably know this is um, creative people are not different than any other people. Um, I think sometimes there's a label or a stigma maybe because their gifts and talents are different, um, but they're not different. Uh, the fruits of the spirit still live inside of them. They're the same men and women than just like we all are. Um, so I think that that's kind of how I got into the creative world. And I'll be honest with you guys, I got into it um, and I loved it. Like I, when I ended up leaving Louisiana, came up here to New York City um, to, to kind of lead the creative department of Times Square Church. And it's um, the working with creative people have taught me more than anything that I you know, could have ever learned in school or from teaching world geography or anything like that. Um, it's just a special thing. And I think sometimes creative, and you guys probably know this, to me, creativity, it's not just, I think sometimes we think it's like, oh, they're painters or they're singers or graphic designers. Um, but I tell people all the time, to me, creativity is just, it's an ability to solve problems. It's an ability to look at things differently. Um, whether you're doing small groups or you're a real estate agent or you are a musician or whatever, most people look at the world and go, well, that's the way it is. But I think I think creative people have a have a unique ability to look at something and go, OK, well, that's the way it is now, but it doesn't have to stay like mm -hmm. that. They can think outside of the box and create new solutions. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of how I ended up in the creative field. So let me push back on that. I'm really glad Aaron asked that question, because I think the perception of creative individuals is two things. Number one. There's a sensitivity, and I actually think that that's healthy, but it's also unhealthy because, like, you're putting your work out there, um, you know, but also you're trying to put your mind into the people that you're serving through creativity. But there's also subjectivity where, like, when, when I, like, when I write something, it's not like there's a rubric that says like this is creative or not there's a set like there's people you either like it or you don't like it so you said hey they're people but there's this perception of sensitivity and subjectivity i don't know i mean do you agree with that push back on that what do you think um i think 
think, you know, I think that's a general perception, maybe because I think, and you guys probably know this, um, there's a great book, I think it's called The Other Half of Church. Peter, you probably know about it. Um, mm-hmm. And he talks a lot about this, the church were generally geared towards um, you know, right brain type stuff, you know, memorization and here, do your spiritual disciplines and do your, so what are most pastors that, you know, they have an ability to think and read and write and preach and do all these, you know, type A personality type things driven. But I think kind of the creativity, a lot of times, you know, happens on the left side of the brain. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the creative, I think creatives, a lot of creatives, I think sometimes that tension point, Peter, is maybe pastors or whoever they're dealing with are different than them and just wired differently, not in a bad way, a good way, just different. And sometimes I think anytime we work with someone different, it's going to be it, it, it's anybody. Anytime someone's not exactly like us, mm. it's you know, it is a tension point. We have to we have to work through that. But I really don't think that. um you know, I don't, I wouldn't consider myself um, any more sensitive than, you know, anyone else, but I would consider myself creative. And like you said, Peter, I love what you said. You're writing, you guys are podcast hosting, you're, that's all creative stuff, you know, and it takes, it takes something to put it out there into the world that other people are going to be looking at. Um, And so I think that, I think that we're all, you, I remember when I first became creative director and Aaron, you know, this is, I remember my pastor told me this. He said, you can't get to, you can't get too worked up because everything you do will be seen. Mm. Every video, every graphic, every song, every social media post, every email. Whereas maybe, you know, when I was doing youth ministry, every single thing I did in youth ministry is not going to be seen by the entire church. So I kind of had a little more freedom to mess up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so I think sometimes, you know, whether maybe if creatives are more sensitive or not, but they're open to more scrutiny, because like you said, Peter, you're putting it out there for everybody to see. Mm. So uh, just following up on that, what, in your experience, the churches you've worked at, um, especially your most recent one, you know, uh, but also the church before we were creative director, what have you seen when, um, you know, churches that tend, you, you mentioned the, the right brain, left brain, things like that. If a church really embraces the creativity of some of its, um, whether it's a, someone in the congregation or it's a staff person, uh, what are some of the good things you've seen of that? Um, and I guess the second part of that question is, have you ever seen, you know, the creativity maybe get not have the direction it needs and what, what happens then? I'm just curious about your experiences. Yeah, no, Aaron, I think that, you know, I've been very, very fortunate. I've been in two church settings that embraced creativity and I was always under leadership and had pastors that said, yeah, we want to be innovative. We want to push the envelope and do things that, you know, will help us reach more people for Jesus. And I think that in those kind of environments, it allows people to thrive. And, in, and in not even just in the quote unquote creative department, but in all departments, whether it's the small group ministry, the youth ministry, the kids ministry, um, when pastors and leaders uh, embrace that, that's when change can occur. Because I mean, creativity, I think I mentioned this earlier, but creativity is not just those graphs, but it's an ability to think differently. So mm. if I'm running the small group ministry and people are not signing up and we go, oh, okay, let's start thinking, how do we get more people to sign up? It's not going to be because we made a prettier graphic. I mean, it's not going to be because, you know, we did five more social media posts. It's going to be, okay, let's change our messaging. What kind of story can we tell to get someone to see themselves in this, in this story, you know, so it's pastors that it's, it's, you know, a pastor, I mean, I've, I've been with pastor before and they, uh, that I'm, my last pastor at Times Square Church, he does an amazing job of telling stories in his messages of life change that happened through small groups. That is way more effective than a social media post or an email. Mm-hmm. Um, and all he's doing, all we're doing is we're modeling what Jesus did. He's the greatest storyteller of all time. Um, so I think that churches that embrace that and churches that are willing to go, let's try that. Um, I remember when I was doing youth ministry we we did all we would try to do all kinds of crazy things to get kids to the but but our pat and they didn't all work some of them were pretty silly um but we always had leaders and pastors that and and again it's not even just a creative thing but i think 
when pastors and leaders can embrace failure and let it let people know that hey it's okay to fail here this is a safe place to fail there's no such thing as failure failure we're just learning um, you know, it's all it's all R and D. It's all research and development. Every new <laughs> idea we try is just okay. That worked. Uh, you know, uh, last year we did our creative team. We made a film for Easter called The Prodigal, and we filmed it. Um, we had a we had a kid on our team. He's not a kid. He's a doll, but he's 22 years old. Just graduated from college and he had this idea he felt like god had given him this thing to show to use the prodigal story of the prodigal son about easter and about the hope that we have in jesus and that god is always welcoming us home and i remember when he first pitched it to me i was like whoa i don't know this is kind of crazy and i remember um going pitch it to kind of like our senior leadership team and they're going that's amazing let's do it and i remember we walked out of there and go oh wow awesome. They, they want us to do it. Now we have to do it, (laughs) but (laughs) now we have to do it. But I think that's a healthy culture and we made a million mistakes, but you know, that weekend, 232 people raised their hand to be born again in church, whether it's through the movie or not, who knows. But, um, you know, that was, that was, a leadership team that was willing to say, let's do something crazy, fly to Miami and film a movie and air it in the middle of an Easter service. So, um, so I forgot what was the second part of your question. <laughs> well, uh, well, well, stay right there. We'll, we'll come back to Aaron's question. Cause I, I think you're actually going to a place that I think we need to discuss because the church is seen as not creative. I mean, I, there's probably people out there that the perception of the church is creative. And I, I think part of that is the, there's this odd tension, like the gospel message doesn't change, but how we communicate that changes. And, you know, you mentioned the prodigal son. Uh, so Jesus told a story that was very relatable about the gospel to people then. And so even I'm even wondering in that process about the prodigal son, like you you have like Bible thumper pastor, I'll throw myself under the bus. That's like Miami. Well, you know, that's not, you know, relatable to scripture. So there's this weird tension of like trying to help people understand if Jesus was to tell that story today, while also being true to the gospel. How do you manage that text or how do you manage that tension? I mean, do you see that as a problem? Is that more a problem for the people in the rows and the pews? I, I don't know. Just push back on that. No, um, Peter, that's, I mean, yeah, I think that is a problem. (laughs) I think that's what's stopping some of our innovation, to be honest. I think that um, there's a pastor in New Jersey, and I I heard him say this one time, um, uh, and it's kind of fitting. The name of his church is Liquid Church, and he said that, water is water kind of goes into it. The thing about water, it's, it's fluid, it's flexible, and it kind of forms to the container that it's in, whether it's a water bottle, it could be a big bucket, whatever it can. So he, he made a great point of like that water can never change. Our message can never change. What's in that water can't change, but the container has got to change. We, we can change the container that it's in. Now we're still transporting the same message, you know? Um, so I, I think, that I think that, you know, the church throughout the history has been the change agent. Think about it. I mean, you have, uh, you know, the virgin birth. Then we have Pentecost. Then we're going, oh, we're going to go reach the Gentiles. They're doing things that are countercultural. Then Martin Luther comes along with the Reformation. And then somewhere along the way, around the 20, I mean, even I'm going back thinking um, I was in Paris this summer and I went to the Louvre. I mean, the greatest paintings all have a religious tune to it. Those were the artists, um, the music. Um, I, I think I think it was Bach. He said, you know, all music is made for the glory of God. So music, art, the Reformation, all these things, the church was that they were the ones going, let's do this outlandish thing. Let's do this innovative thing. I mean, look at Jesus. The people he's hanging out with, that's why the Pharisees hated him. You know, so I think what you're saying, Peter, I think, unfortunately, there are Pharisees in the church today. And, um, you know, when Peter is a fisherman, what are the Pharisees saying? Oh, this guy, like, just go catch the fish. You know, they looked at him just as, they, they, you know, he's just this normal guy, like, oh, he doesn't matter. But Jesus saw him with different set of eyes and goes, no, 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 no. This guy is a, he's a prophet. This guy is a preacher. This guy's a pastor. And so I think, 
I do think that um, there are a lot of Pharisees, to use that word, in the church today that look at it and go, oh, they got the big screens. Oh, they got the loud music. Jesus was going, oh, I don't care. I'll go preach to these people that the rest of you guys, you know, you pushed them to the side. Jesus picked these 12 people that nobody else would have picked. Um, Jesus said, I'm going to spend my life with them. And so I think that, um, yeah, absolutely. I do feel like there are, you know, unfortunately today, people pushing up upon that and saying, oh, we can't do that. Um, but again, we, we've got to stay orthodox in our theology, but our strategy, but our strategy can change. Mm-hmm. Um, the theology doesn't change. Jesus loves people. He's the same, you know, God's the same yesterday, today for none of that stuff changes, but how we communicate. I mean, go through the history and we went from the the Gutenberg, all these different things. Um, those are changing. That container has got to change. That's no, uh, thank you for saying all that. And I, I, uh, I appreciate Peter, you jumping in there too. Um, so I, uh, earlier you, you mentioned a number of different channels, um, of communication, uh, even in church, you mentioned Sundays, you mentioned social media, you mentioned things like that. Um, so in the, I, in the hope of being creative across those channels, like an embracing creativity, not, not, uh, pushing back on it. Um, at least, in, you know, finding the right balance there. I'm just, I like, I'd love to, uh, maybe this would be fun for our listeners too, but I'd love to know like, what's, and let's pick one channel first. I want to go to social media in a minute, but I want to, let's stick to Sunday morning for a minute in person, Sunday morning. What's kind of the, what's a, a fun, uh, exciting when you have seen um, a church do well, well, it's your church or a different church do well on a Sunday morning uh, from a creative lens. Um, and then I'd also love to know if you've seen like a total flop because it's okay to not, like you said, it's okay to embrace. You're not always going to bat a home run there, but um, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Aaron. I think that, um, you know, like you said, there's so many mediums and I'm so glad that you said that, that it's not just Sunday morning. There's opportunities for us to reach people creatively all week, podcasts and social media and websites and emails and Sunday morning experience is part of that. Um, and I think, I think something to, I think every church is different too. I think whatever your goal is, I've been in churches where the goal is on Sunday mornings, we are going after the person that's never been in church. They don't know anything about Jesus. So it is very seeker sensitive. We want to make sure that, um, that, you know, all that everything is excellent. We're not going to use kind of Christianese language or club language, if you will. Um, and then I've been in churches where it is very much take those believers and go deeper. I don't think either is right or wrong. Um, I'll just use the, I'll just use the kind of seeker sensitive service. So, um, I, I heard a story. I'll, I'll tell you a story, a personal story. When I was at my church in Louisiana, I had got out of coaching. I was just working on staff at the church. I think I was doing youth ministry at the time. And some of the players, um, some of the athletes from the university, I was still in contact with them. Um, they, we had you know, talked to the coaches. We set up a day, like a university day for them to come to church and we're going to honor them, all this stuff. And one of the, one of the young ladies after she came up to me, never been in church in her life. And the thing that blew her away more than, and this was probably eight or nine years ago. So technology creative is not even what it is today. The thing that blew her away of everything in the church service goes, Oh my gosh, I can't believe y'all made all those videos for this. And the video she was talking about was church announcement. She was like, for us, she was like, she was like, I felt like I was in the movie. So like once I saw that, and then when the pastor started talking, she goes, I was like, whoa, this is a legit thing. So I paid attention to him. And it's like, that's, it's just the church news. It's not anything, every church in America does church news, you know, but it's just amazing. You don't know, it doesn't have to be this huge um, production. Um, it could be something as simple as church news. This year for Easter service, there's a girl that I play tennis with. Um, I've played tennis with her the last couple of years. Um, she's not a believer. I've been inviting her to church. She never would come, never would come. And finally for Easter, uh, we made a movie trailer for the prodigal film that we made. So I texted her, it was, I texted her the YouTube link and I was like, Hey, um, me and some of my friends made a film. Do you want to come and do you want to come watch it with this? And there's going to be music, stuff like that. 
Yeah. And she goes, when is it? I said, Sunday at 10 and one. And the showings are at 10 and one. And she goes, okay, great. I'll be there. That girl came to the church service, um, listened to the whole thing, raised her hand at the end of the service to be born again. Wow. And whatever got her there, I think it's Craig Rochelle who says, we will do anything short of sin to reach people for Jesus. In order to reach people who've never been reached, you have to do something that's never been done. And um, so I do think that that's, you know, and then on the flip side of that, sure, I've seen a lot of epic fails. Um, I've seen technology fails. I mean, a few months ago, our entire, I mean, we're streaming to 42 countries every Sunday. You've got, you know, thousands of YouTube viewers. You've got thousands of people in the room. Service is about to start. And I have to tell the senior pastor, hey, we have no sound, we have no light, and we have no video. And he looks at me and said, what are we going to do? I said, not sure yet. Give me like two minutes and I'll get back to you. Went in the back. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm yelling at our 24-year-old production. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, um, you know, we're, we're scrambling. We have nothing. And our worship leader, amazing, gets up there. We have no microphones, no screens, no audio, no nothing. And we just start singing. And the Holy Spirit came in that place like I've never felt before. Mm. Um, so I think there's, you know, technology is a tool, but it's not, um, you know, we all, you know, the technology is a tool that the Holy Spirit can use, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to change things and change people. Mm. Cool. Um, so we had a podcast guest, his name's Daryl Hall, and he talked about preaching to generations. And basically, yeah. the younger that generations get, there's this more desire for authenticity. So like from millennial to Gen Z and now, you know, my daughters are part of Generation Alpha. And, you know, I, I'm just kind of wondering because you're in this day and out, like there's this desire to be authentic, but there's also this desire to be excellent. So we want the sound good, that sound great or good or whichever one. Somebody from English is going to correct me on that. Uh, that's why Aaron's here. <laughs> but but like so so like one of the jokes at Browncroft is like smoke machines. Like so mm -hmm. they're like like why do we have smoke machines and you know so how do you navigate this desire for authenticity in a field that demands excellence? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> um, but I can tell you just kind of the things that you're exactly right. Um, my entire creative team was, you know, under the age of 27, 26 years old. And so I'm not old. I wouldn't consider myself, but I'm a lot older than that. And so it is, it is a gap and it's, um, you know, and it's like you said, Peter, you're learning from your daughter. I'm learning from those guys every day. And I think part of it, the tension that we're facing is this is the first generation that's ever, you guys know this, you, you know, you're like me when we we're growing up, you have to go to college to get the information. Mm. When you get a job, your boss has the information because they're the boss. Um, you know, I read something yesterday, only 51% of Gen Z is even considering college. When I was growing up, you had to go to college. Let's be very honest. Most job, not most jobs, but there are a lot of jobs, especially in the creative world, the creator, and I'm saying creator, like content creators, videos and graphics, you don't have to go to college. You can watch about 50 hours of YouTube and, you know, be able to do that job. And so this generation, um, they're the first generation that is also creators. They, they know how to do all that stuff. Whereas 10 years ago, that girl who came into church from the basketball team, that wasn't an option for the normal person to do that. Now they're making YouTube videos on their iPhone. They're, you know, all these different things. So they're looking at, they're not impressed with our smoke machines. They're not impressed with our LED walls. They're not impressed with our audio system. They're not impressed with any of that. But what they are impressed with, like you said, Peter, is that authentic authenticity and um, and it is it's a tension of, of excellence. But I think there, you know, if you walk into church and there's a thousand people, you're not going to get that 
you're not going to get, you're not going to know if someone's authentic or not. The only thing you're judging when you walk in that room is the excellence of the room. I think it's on the churches. I think that we've got to do a better job of that engagement and the connection point after a Sunday morning. That's where we show the authenticity, because let's be honest, they're not even coming to church every week before the pandemic. It was what 1.7 times a month. People are coming to church. It's probably less than that now. And so Sunday mornings, that experience, um, you know, I live in New York City. I love sports. I've been to like four professional sports games live the last two years. So when I go, I need I want it to be excellent. I want the great experience. But the rest of the time I'm interacting with them on their social media channels. Mm. I'm listening to their their podcasts, like what you guys are doing. I'm, so to me, a Sunday morning is not our opportunity to show our authenticity. You know, um, if it's, I mean, yes, it is. It is. You want to be authentic. Mm -hmm. You want to do all that, but that's not where you're going to get that. That's not where you're going to win someone's heart. Um, so to me, it's, I think that's, again, I haven't, don't have it figured out by any means. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the tension that with that were even, I'll, I'll say this, even like the podcast that you guys are doing, I read something the other day, I think 41% of, um, of people in America are listening to podcasts every single day and Christian podcasts make up the largest subcategory of podcasts. So it's like, why are, why are, why are we not doing more podcasts? You know, if I'm a Gen Z -er and I walk into my church and I hear about this, why God, why, why God, why God, why podcast? And I listen to it now and I'm going, Oh, okay. That's who Aaron and Peter are. Cause on a Sunday morning, I'm not going to know Aaron and Peter. I'm not going to know the worship leader, but these kind of conversations, um, I think that's where you develop the relationships and the authenticity with people. We are going to save that clip and we're going to send it to every church leader. You know why we do podcasts. <laughs> Sally, you're worth every interview. Go ahead. Aaron. I, I, as soon as you said that, I no. knew Peter was going to, you know, he's going to clip that one from there and, uh, and send it around. Um, so how you, I, I noticed that when we're, when we're, uh, when we're taping this, um, taping it. I just showed my age by using the word taping. But anyways, I'll just uh -oh. uh, uh -oh. <laughs> we're recording this. Um, you know, you ha I noticed on uh, on your site, you had just put a, a blog post up about how churches shouldn't sync themselves on social media. Um, I think that was this week, right? I mean, I could be wrong. Um, how can a church, you know, and you just mentioned social media, like, so that's a way to connect with people, not on Sunday morning. Um, I think that this question can be bigger than just for, just for churches, but since we're talking about churches, what's a good way for, what, what should a church be doing from a creative lens to really engage people well, um, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or whatever? Um, I we'll mean, say it, mm -hmm. we'll say it. TikTok. Oh, I mean, be uh, <laughs> TikTok. Be real. That's the new one. Be real. Have you guys heard of that oh, one? Well. That's a new. That's a new social media. Uh, and right. you know what, Peter? To go back to so so, Aaron. Great question. I'm so glad you asked that. That's, that's I'm very passionate about that because so be real is a brand new social media platform. Um, last week, um, one of my 23 year old people on my creative team texted me and said, you need to download Be Real. So I said, okay, let's be real. Be Real is the opposite of Tic Tac. Tic Tac. Tic, I'm showing my age now. Tic Tac. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up with, t you eat the Tic Tacs. Oh, yeah, Tic Tac is when you do you. dances. <laughs> <laughs> but so Be Real is the opposite. So once a day, they send a notification and no matter where you are, you take a picture front and back camera and it goes out to your followers. And like you're, that's the chance to be authentic because they're saying a lot of this generation um, Gen Z, you know, alpha, all of that. They're saying Instagram, TikTok is too curated. You, you mm. put the edits on it. You, you edit it down. Mm. You can change it. You can change it 20 times till you get it perfect. Be real is when they send the notification, you got to click the picture and wherever you're doing at that time. So that's a way to, for them to be authentic. Um, so to kind of speak to your question, Aaron, I'm so glad you asked that, that, that is such a big thing to me. And that is a passion of mine of, um, social media is to be social. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's not to be, it's not to be a billboard, a social, I, I, if you're a, you guys, you know, I, I, you guys have a great church and I've seen your services and Peter, I've had an opportunity to visit with you a few times and you guys are very relational. When you meet people on a Sunday morning in your lobby, I know you're talking to them. You're interacting with them, your greeters, your ushers, your volunteers, you're doing the same thing. So to me, churches and businesses that can do that on social media as well. It's like when you someone walks into your church on Sunday for the first time, you're not going to shake their hand and go, hey, don't forget, we have our Harvest Fest this Saturday, October 19th at three o'clock. Drop your candy on the way out. No, you're going to go, hey, who are you? How you doing? Where are you from? Is this your first time here? We're so glad you're here. And I think churches and businesses said that um, it it, exactly like you were saying, Peter, authentic is better than produced. Mm. Authentic is better than produced, especially on social media. Um, so my, I'll give you a great example, a practical example. My sister just took a job, Aaron, you'll appreciate this, as a communications director at a church in Louisiana. They have less than 100 people. She's only the second staff member. It's the pastor and herself, That just, which I told her is a great that they value that so much in the world, but church less than a hundred people. My parents go there and she's like, what do I do? They don't have one camera. They don't have one microphone. They have nothing. And I said, you take this iPhone right here and you guys are doing a pump. They're doing like a pumpkin patch. I said, you go out there, you take a bunch of pictures and you put it together on Instagram and you find a song and you put it up. That's a reel do a reel right there. That's free. That doesn't cost you anything. And you don't, don't say, Oh, it's five o'clock. You take pictures of the, my mom was out there the other day, 65 years old, setting up pumpkins, you know, the pastors out there, um, you know, putting the sign. And I said, you show that stuff. And then you talk to the pastor on your little iPhone, no mic and say, Hey, why, why are we doing this? You know? Oh, well we want to raise money. We're doing this because we're raising money for the battered women in our, let me tell you the story of why that's so important important to me. And she did that. I think she she started, they didn't even have an Instagram account. She did that last week. She literally did that last week. Um, Thousands of views. I mean, it's not viral, but for a thousand views for someone who didn't even have an Instagram account with an iPhone not produced. Um, So to me, that's, that's the key to it, Aaron. It's, it's finding ways to be engaging. Nobody, nobody is coming to your church on a Sunday morning because you're starting a new series. No one cares except you, your (laughs) pastor and the creative team. No one's coming to your church. I mean, every, you know, we post pictures of the smiling faces in the parking lot, holding up the pop signs. It's going to be a great day at church. Um, But you guys are pastors. You know this. There's hurting and broken people in the world that they're they're just coming to church for a last ditch effort. They need Mm. something. They need Jesus. And so on social media, instead of let's 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 move away from saying what we have. Oh, it's come. We're starting the series on on, you know, relationships or we're doing this. Let's make it about the people and go, hey, we know you're hurting. We know it's been a rough week. We know, hey, here's five Bible verses on, you know, that can help you in your time of need. And then take your iPhone and let the pastor give a two minute thing of like, hey, man, we know that we know that life is hard right now. But I want to tell you about an anchor that you can hold on to Um, come this morning. I want to share that with you and just speaking to people's felt needs, like where they are in their life, not necessarily where you are or where your church is or what your church needs. Because when you engage people, guess what? They're going to engage in what you're doing anyway. Hmm. Um, So I I love where we're going. Um, One thing I want you to do. So kind of two questions that will roll up into one number number one yeah it, if i'm a creative at a church how how do i navigate that kind of field of right brain thinkers so just from your experience if not even a staff person i'm just someone that's creative you know what advice would you give to them and then number two can you paint a picture of what like because our question is why are creatives the future of the church? And I think those two questions are related. What does in your mind the church look like in the next 10 years, you know, by responding to this question? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. It's a big question. <laughs> what does the church look like in 10 years? I do think that um, 
you know, as a create, I'll start at the beginning, which you said, as a creative, how do I navigate those waters or how does a creative in a church navigate that? I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. I think this applies not just to creative as in that department that they work in, but I think it's creative thinkers in the church. It's innovative thinkers in the church. It's people who want to see change, who want to see the next generation reached. Um, so in order to do that, I think, um, number one, obviously, in, in this goes for any field, you have have to you have to build trust um you have to build trust with your leadership and how do you build trust i mean that's we could go down that you know it's doing your job well it's honoring it's um you know it's doing what's asked of you it's doing more than what's asked of you it's showing up on time it's caring about people it's serving it's loving it's all of those things and so um i think that i think when you show when you sh- I mean, as a leader i know i'm gonna give the more that people um, on my creative team show their buy-in, the more trust I give. Mm. Um, and unfortunately it doesn't always, you know, unfortunately sometimes it, it takes longer than we want. Um, but it also lasts longer than we want, I think. And so I think just as a creative, um, showing that, you know, Hey, I care about the same mission that you do pastor. I care about the same mission that you do. I want to reach people for Jesus. I did this research. Um, and it's, and it's also, it's also, I think I mentioned this earlier, but every church has a different vision. You know, it's, if you're the, some churches are called to reach the globe. They believe in online church. Some are feel like they're called to their local area. Whatever your church's mission is, as a creative, you got to buy into that vision because that's not your job to to create the vision. That's the pastor's job. And so whatever his vision is, you you're taking that vision and you're applying it to your area. And I think um, the future of that, Peter, I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> um But I do think that it is, I do think that the local church is never going away. I think there's going to be a lot of different expressions of it. And I think anyone who would tell you that, you know, we could go into a whole discussion on digital church and online. Yes, I do think that's going to be a part of it. But the in-person physical meetings of people that will never go away. Um, you know, I, I love watching the New Jersey Nets on TV, but man, that once a year that I go to the game in person is a whole different experience, mm-hmm. you know? And I think as churches that will never lose that whole experience, but we also have to realize people aren't coming every single week. So how are we going to reach them and disciple them outside of those four walls? That's the future of the church, the churches that can embrace that. Um, You know, technology is not the enemy. (laughs) We have a real enemy and his name is the devil. And that's been since the beginning of time. That's the enemy. So the the enemy is not technology. Um, I think Craig Rochelle said this, the church of the future is going to have to find a way to be 100% physical and 100% digital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do we do that? I don't know. We need someone to figure that part out. Um, But I think the future of the church is going to be, I mentioned this earlier, but things are flipping, you know, in the 80s, 90s leaders and leadership was it's the command and control. The leaders had all the knowledge. The leaders had all the power. So the young people had to come up under them and learn. And I think the future, not just in church, the next five to 10 years is, and you're already seeing it. Every single person, I don't mean this humbly. I mean this truthfully. Every single person on my creative team is smarter than me. They know mm-hmm. they know more about video, graphics, social media, email marketing, all that. They do. They're just, they grew up with it. They research it more. But there's some skills I think that I do have that I can share with them. So the future of the church is churches that can embrace that and go, hey, 22 year old video guy that, you know, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you all this trust because I believe that you're going to be able to tell a powerful story that, you know, is going to help reach people for Jesus. Um, You know, story to me, storytelling is going to be big into the future, um, which, again, that's Jesus. (laughs) He's the greatest storyteller of all time. Um, so I think that finding ways to do that in, again, it's, you said this earlier, Peter, but the, the, the message never changes, but the method has to constantly be changing. And the churches that can do that, um, you know, the, that's going to be, that, that's, that's, that's where 
that's where people are going to thrive. That's where people are going to come to know Jesus. That's where people are going to get health um, and move the mission forward. Mm. Do you think that's all the more the case now? I mean, I guess, um, you know, we, we're, we're in New York, which is obviously a very different uh, terrain than uh, Louisiana or, or, or other certain parts. You know, every part of the country is different. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I think you could, as a church, for a while, kind of, I don't know, you could count on people having some sort of frame of reference for Christianity and church, and it was, whether or not they went, it was, it was a known, co- you know, commodity of, it was something that was there. Um, you know, it seems like more and more that's not the case for a growing portion of people, and um seems to me like you would have to be creative if you want to continue to engage in people who don't have any, I mean, like, I guess in, in, in the, the early days of the church, uh, the apostle Paul or other apostles were having to engage people who didn't have a context for the story they were bringing them. Um, you know, ha- I'm just throwing out ideas, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like yeah. how, how, how the church should be embracing that, that new reality in our country. Yeah, no, I agree, Aaron. I mean, I think we all would agree. We're, we're, we're either here or we're entering into a post-Christian world. And it's something, you know, that, like you said, we grew up, everyone went to church. Maybe not every week. Maybe you weren't a Christian, but like that Christmas and Easter, you went to church. That's not the case anymore. And um, that's unfortunate. But as the church, again, it's going back to that definition of creativity is, you know, we can look at it and go, well, it's the way it is. These young people, these that are, we can look at it from a creative mind and go, okay, Now we got to figure this out. What are we going to do that's different? And it's going to be, you know, maybe it's it it is changing those methods and it is um, it's getting back to, you know, that look at Paul. I mean, you just mentioned Paul. Half of the New Testament was written from prison like that was kind of innovative before you had to preach in person. Paul's preaching it. Thank God he didn't have to be in person or we lose half the New Testament. You know, look at Paul is thrown in the flesh. The thing that, you know, the thing that kind of restricted him was actually the thing that led him to be a great leader. He goes, man, I'm going to, you know, God's kind of given me this. So it almost became a constraint. And so as the church right now, the I guess you could use the word unbelief of the world, maybe is a constraint. So I think we've got to figure out a way to go, OK, not, oh, now we can't do it, but go, OK, we have to use a different method now. Maybe we have to be a little more. It's whether it's social media and also, you know, Gen Z or this next generation they do want authenticity, but they also want purpose and they want that they're, I don't want to use this. I, I don't use this word lightly, but they are activists in a sense. They mm-hmm. want to, they, they want to be a part of something, a bigger mission than, than they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And if we can find a creative way, I mean, think about it. The story of Jesus Christ is the greatest thing in the history of the world. That's bigger than anyone. So we've got to find ways to be able to tell that story and to be able to get back to that and let them realize, no, 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 this is a great thing to be a part of. Don't look at, sure, there's churches that are going to mess up, let, but let's not look at that. Let us let me show you something even better, something that's going to last forever. Mm-hmm. It's not a building. It's not a social media ad. It's not a website. Site, um, but it's the hope and love of Jesus Christ. Um, so I think that's that's just something you know. Well, and and one of the things I, I kind of want to point out because this time's gone fast, and before we even get to our last question, and I want to hear your thoughts on this. I I think the the twentieth century, the the theological thrust was the resurrection, where um, you know, so Lee Strobel wrote the book The Case for Christ. And there was a little bit more right brain thinking. I think even Gen Xers, um, love you, Aaron. Um, I think Gen <laughs> Xers, it, it, it was, it was. Hey, don't just tell me that it's right. You know, prove it to me. And I'm wondering if um, the 21st century is about the kind of the theological value of incarnation. So. When I think of when we talk about the incarnation, it, that's the Christmas story. Jesus comes down from heaven to earth and lives among people. And you know what I what I tell pastors because people think I talk out of both sides of my mouth about the in person and digital. And really, what's the foundation of that? And what's the foundation of creativity is being present. And Jesus's ministry 
And even what you described to Paul, you're being present, whether it's a letter because you're in prison or whether you're actually, you know, at the Sea of Galilee. And I think even for today, when we think about being creative, it's asking ourselves this, how are we present to the world? And that's not just showing up. It's are we aware of what's going on? Are we aware of the the um, awareness of anxiety and depression? Are we aware of how hard it is to build relationships? And I think that, that we've, we've just moved, not that the resurrection's not important, but we've just moved from a different theological um, kind of perspective to help people see in order for you to experience Jesus, there is that incarnational versus, you know, trying to prove the resurrection, trying to prove that, I don't know, maybe I'm a heretic. Aaron will tell me later, when I edit this out. but I, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that one of those theological principles is more important. I do think one can be more relatable at a time that actually leads to the other. So I'd say right now we're in an incarnational stage that leads to resurrection, but people have to know your presence before they know the message. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Peter. I mean, look at the look at the Gospels. Jesus saw people. I mean, he saw the woman with the issue of blood. He saw the immoral woman. Um, look at the Good Samaritan. All the religious people walk by um, before Jesus could ever, you know, tell the 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 blind and the the sick, the leper. Before he could ever heal them, before all of that, he had to see them. And he had to meet them right there and say, you know, I'm not here to discuss this. I'm here to, you know, to, to love you and to care about you. And you're exactly right. I think as the church, the more that um, we can go out and meet people where they are. That's why, and I know, Peter, you do an amazing job. I mean, I've learned so much from you, just even how you guys do your small group ministry. And to me, that's the best way. Um, that's the best way to get people are going to be willing to come to your home and to know you. Um, what is the, uh, you know, it's, there's actually five gospels. I know you first was the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but then there's you, people yeah. are going to read you. Um, the, the girl I mentioned earlier that we played tennis, um, I played tennis with her for two years and it was a few other people from our church. If those other people and myself were jerks to her, she would never step foot in that church, you know? Um, so, but it's caring about the things that people care about and meeting their needs. That's what Jesus did. I mean, that, that's who he was. Um, I came to serve, not to be served. And I think that you're exactly right. The more that we can meet people there, no judgment. No, I don't need you. Think about it. Jesus called the disciples at the beginning. He said, Hey, just come with me. I don't need you to do anything. Just, just come with me. And three years later, those disciples were willing to die for him. They were willing to give their life for him. And so I think it's this church is the same way. The more that we can serve people with no, we're not asking for anything back. Um, we're here to love you. And um, that's, there's no greater, there's no greater gospel. There's no greater um, ex, ex, exhibition of the gospel, I guess is maybe a way to put it. Hmm. Sally, um we're going to have you back on again. This is going to be a lot of fun. So, um, <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, so oh, you guys are awesome. The, the question that we always end uh, podcast with is what does Jesus have to say about this topic? So the good news is, is Aaron and I, uh, we answer it first and then you get to clean up whatever communication creative mess we like. <laughs> Does that sound good? I love it. Let's go. I love it. You want me to start here? Uh, I, your call. Sure, why not? Go ahead. Um, then you can clean clean up uh, my mess. Yeah, no, I, I obviously I think it's a great conversation. Um, you know, I think we hit on we've hit we've hit this theme a number of times in this conversation. But we, we need to be. I think Jesus wants us to be creative. I mean, he gave us creative gifts. Some people are creative as um, artists. Um, some people are creative with their words, whether that's written or spoken. Some people are, you know, we've had some podcasts with um, those with great engineering minds and some of those, you know, sometimes the creativity is not with the, the graphics. It could be with the structural, I mean, whatever. Um, but people, right. people are seeing, just kind of like Sally said, God has given us the ability to see not just things the way they are and say, okay, well, that's that, but seeing like what, what could be. And, that, and for the church, I think that's important. You need to be able to see how to... 
okay, right now this is the situation, um, or this is what people in my community think of this church. Um, well, how do we how do we how do we reach them? Um, not just to get <laughs> brownie points for the church. How do we reach them so that they they get to know Jesus and um, hear that compelling message that has power all by itself? But we need to be creative on how we um, how we bring that to people. So I think that that's uh, it's important. Aaron, always so good. Um, I love it. So I, I kind of want to start where Sally started, which was, you know, we think of creativity as sometimes colors, fonts, videos, but Sally defined it in such a way as you're, you're trying to solve a problem. And I think as you read the scripture, you know, Jesus is always solving problems in ways that people don't understand. And you know, we, we talked about it, you know, in the New Testament church, the conflict that was happening was there was two ethnic groups, the Jews and the Gentiles that were coming together and they were solving problems creatively. Um, and I'll just, I'll just kind of jump even forward. You know, we mentioned Gutenberg. It, we have Bibles on our phones, we can Google them, but Gutenberg decided to print the Bible, which was this crazy idea. And, um, you know, I want to take a moment just to honor probably the most creative pastor I've ever known. Um, he never even had social media, but the pastor I grew up with, Ron Piedmont um, in Binghamton, New York, just out of the blue decided to have a five-minute uh, television program called It's a Wonderful Life, literally It's a Wonderful wow. Life, right before uh, oh, okay. the Today Show started. And when I would spend time with him as a kid, um, you know, whether I was a student in high school or even a college graduate, you know, people would walk up to him. He was their pastor. He was kind of the digital pastor before it even happened. And I think what we saw was, you know, Jesus is always pushing us to be creative so that people know that they matter. And what That's Ron right. Piedmont was like was on TV, who he was, was who he was in person and the stories that he told was who he was in person and that's a representation of jesus so you know why is why are creatives the future of the church it's because people need to know that they matter people need to know that beyond the social media whatever the platform is in person that they're seen and they're heard and so i don't know that's that's where i'd leave it sally go ahead clean it up oh that's great no that's great guys that's i mean you guys are absolutely right and i think uh it's funny i that definition of creative it's what's funny i remember um i went a few months ago i went back home to louisiana and I asked my five-year-old nephew um i'm always you know i said oh that's so cre show me what you're doing i'm always convinced show me what you're doing like and so we start talking about, and i asked him i said you know you're you're so creative he goes yeah i like to have fun and make stuff <laughs> so it's like that's you think about it. That's the, his definition of creativity. And I think um, it's it, gosh, you guys are exactly right. Jesus said that it's the little children that will inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I think I heard a story the other day. Um, NASA before Apollo 11, they did, got hired this researcher and they go, we're going to have all these problems. We need creative thinkers. We need people who are not just trying to plug something in and go, OK, it works. They're going to have to be innovative. So they did this series of tests, found the most creative people to solve. They hired their people. Well, then they said, let's go one step further. They said these questions are simple um, because they said we're going to hire creative geniuses. So anyone they hired for Apollo 11, they, they were considered creative genius according to their test. They took that test of simple questions, gave it to a group of five year olds. Do you know that 98 percent of those five year olds rated creative genius just like the astronauts mm. on Apollo 11? But this is the thing. Five years later, when those when those five year olds became 10 years old, they gave them the test again. That number dropped to, I think, 42 percent. Hmm. Five years later, they gave the test to a group of 15 year olds and that number dropped to 18 percent. They didn't hmm. get any stupider. <laughs> they didn't get any less creative. They decided they, they, they decided they weren't going to be as creative anymore. And Jesus said, it's the young, it's the, the children that are inherit the king. Think about this. I mean, we didn't even talk about this, but Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. We all know hmm. that. We say, oh, he's a creative God. So we got to be creative. But the thing about God, he never stopped creating through mm -hmm. all of creation. That's the whole thing. You never stop creating. And I think for all of us, that's the challenge is 
let's 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 have that creativity of the five year olds. We all are creative geniuses because we were made in the image of a creative God. Mm -hmm. And it's easy. That's the first thing he said. But it's also easy to become something that we forget. Um, but but God created us to always be creative and to always be thinking. And like you guys said, we're never let let's not be those people that look at Gutenberg. He did that. You know, I want to add one more thing, Peter, and then I'll promise I'll stop talking. But Gutenberg, mm -hmm. um, many people don't know this. When Gutenberg had the idea for the Bible, he went to his business partner and basically said, OK, let's put all of our money and sell out to this. Like, let's go all the way in. The business partner was like, uh, OK, well, when he did it, he didn't make as much money as he thought. So he sued Gutenberg, Gutenberg lost everything, never really became, never really recouped that. I mean, look at the, look at what Gutenberg has done for us. Gutenberg ended up having to go start the second business and never got back up to that. But he didn't even care. He said, I'm burning the ships for this. And people like us are, we, we get to benefit from him burning the ships on some, on, on taking the crazy innovative idea. And so I think that's, that, that's the challenge for all of us is it's not for us. What are we doing to leave for that next generation? and further generations like Gutenberg did. Hmm. Man, what a place to close. Sally, where's the best place people can follow you? Um, you can just go to my website, sallygillery.com. And I like to have these kind of conversations more just in written format. So that's probably the best way. Um, I would also say subscribe to her weekly email. It's like one of the best emails I get on Wednesday. So I'm just, I'm, I'm oh, going to give thank you, free, you Peter. free promo right there. Well, you oh, can, thank you guys. Yeah. You can find us at whygodwhypodcast.com. Click the subscribe button. That's the best way to get a hold of us. You'll get this episode and many other ones that relate to your life. Thank you so much for joining us. 